Hi everyone, it's great to be here. I'm Dee Poku and I'm really thrilled to introduce a woman who has written a book that is both productive and pragmatic about how we as women and as mothers can achieve success. Um, she is a best-selling author. Her books include what the most successful people do for, before breakfast. <laughs> Read through them again. <laughs> um, all the money in the world, 168 hours, and grind hopping. And as, we, as mentioned, we are here today to discuss her latest book, I Know How She Does It. So Laura, it's really great to have you here. Thank you for having me here. Um, so let's start by talking about the basic premise of the book. Um, so you started with a calculation. Um, well, I'll let you explain how. I, I will. Yes. So um, a lot of the stories I noticed about women and work and life, uh, there are two things. One is that many of them were very negative um, about how women just can't have it all. Things are crazy, stressful, what have you. Um, but the other thing is a lot of this was based entirely on anecdote. And stories are great, but stories are not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get a little bit of data about what the lives of women who had big jobs and families actually looked like. Uh, so from 2013 to 2014, I collected one-week time diaries uh, from women who met two conditions. One is that they earned six figures a year, so they had big jobs, and they also had kids at home. Uh, so under age 18, really in the thick of family life. And I had them keep track of their time, half hour by half hour. I added it up. I uh, wound up with 1,001 days in the lives of successful women to study how much people work and sleep and all that other stuff. Wow. And so in doing those calculations, you also worked out that the average person um, who works a certain number of hours a day and sleeps and eats should also have how many hours of free time a week? Well, not so much free time, but uh, the, the good news is that um, the, these women in my project who all had big jobs um, were working on average 44 hours a week. Now, 44 is more than 40, but it's not 80 either, right? So a little bit more than, than full time. Um, they were also generally sleeping enough. So again, people with six-figure jobs, kids at home, the average amount of sleep in a week was 54 hours. <laughs> so do the math there. It's a little bit under eight hours a day, not too much under eight hours a day. Um, and then it, there are 168 hours in a week, 24 times seven. So subtract 44 and 54, you get 70 hours for other things. So it turns out it wasn't really that surprising that people had full, balanced, personal lives, family lives in 70 hours a week, because that's quite a bit of time. Right, right. So one of my favorite sections actually is the, um, when you talk about the work week. And um, something that we're, I think we're all guilty of here is working very long hours but actually exaggerating the number of hours we actually work. So can you? I'm sure no one here has ever done that, right? <laughs> yeah, no one. Um, so it's a funny thing in human psychology, we tend to remember the worst things uh, and, and they become typical in our minds. So the week where one night you were there till 9 p.m., it's like, oh, I'm working till 9 p.m. every night. Uh, but it turns out that people tend to overestimate their work weeks and they are more wrong the higher they go. So there was one study that compared people's estimated work weeks and time diaries, found that people claiming 70, 80, 90 hour weeks were off by about 25 hours. <laughs> you, you can guess in which direction, right? They're not, they're not underestimating. And so I love that statistic. Like every time somebody tells me about their 80 hour work weeks, I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Subtract 25 and I'll talk. <laughs> And you also, also start to talk about um, people including or thinking that the commute to work is also part of the work. Well, I mean, you know, different people can count it different ways. Um, I chose for my project not to count the commute because generally it isn't working. I mean, if people were commuting with a client or commuting with a coworker or um, otherwise managing to use that time working on the train, then sure, yes, it's work. Um, but most of the time when we're you know, behind the wheel of the car, unless you're practicing speeches, as I sometimes do. Uh, it's, it's, it's not really work. Um, but the thing is, even if you add the commute, people will say, well, that 44 hours doesn't include the commute. Okay, well, even if you added 10 hours onto that, an hour each way, that'd be 54. That would still leave you know, 60 hours in the week for other things. So it's still quite a bit of time. So the women who were completing these time diaries were actually finding that there was 
that there was more space in their week than they even more realized. space that because again we tend to remember the most harried rushed day as typical and yes it happened but other days and other times happen too and so what day is more typical for you is it Tuesday or is it Saturday I mean they, they both occur the same number of times per week and mm -hmm. yet yeah, we'd have a very different impression of your life yeah. looking at those two different days and so I had everyone in my project keep track of their time for a week because I wanted to see where the time went but many people found this an incredible enlightening exercise in their own lives just because we often tell ourselves stories about our time that are not necessarily true um, one people say is like well you know I work full-time so I never see my family mm -hmm. you know, full right it's got the word full in it clearly there's no time for anything else mm -hmm. uh, but they keep track of their time and be like oh well wait you know I leave for work at 8 my kids are up at 530 that's like two and a half hours every morning that we're, we're there and I'm not giving myself any credit for it uh, and, and so things like that would happen a lot right another so simple but novel concept was was really sort of moving away from the idea of a 24-hour day um, and just you know, thinking in a more macro way about days so can you elaborate a bit about that yeah so often people fall into what I call the 24-hour trap like they look at a day and there's all these things they want to do and all those things won't fit in a 24-hour day and so we throw up our hands and say oh life is terrible horrible but we don't live our lives in days, we live our lives more in weeks. And if you look at the whole of 168 hours, you can probably have space for a lot more things. And we, it keeps us from really pitting work and family against each other in the same sort of way. I mean, I was having a conversation with somebody who was like, well, I know my team wants me to take them to happy hour and I can't, I'm a working parent, I feel so guilty, I need to get home to my kids. It's like, well, do they want you to take them to happy hour every single night? Mm -hmm. and no, well, it turns out, you know, most people do not want to hang out every night with their colleagues, like even if all they're caring for is house plants, <laughs> they don't. So, but she could take them out once a week. Well, if she's gone one night a week, she's there reading bedtime stories to her kids six nights a week. Mm -hmm. Six is more than one, like six times greater than one. But in this 168 hour universe, she can be the kind of parent who's doing that almost every single night and the kind of manager who's taking her team out as well. So in 168 hours, we see possibility. Mm -hmm. In 24 hours, it tends to limit us. Right, right. So um, you outlined five strategies for making success po possible. So I want to pull out a couple of examples I particularly liked. Um, one was the, the idea of planning ahead, which we all generally do, but specifically Wasted Mondays. <laughs> wasted Mondays. Wasted Mondays are my, kind of my pet peeve. Um, I found this survey finding that Tuesday was the most productive day in the average office. I'm like, well, why on earth is that? You know, it seems like you start Monday ready to go, it should be the most productive day, but it turns out that a lot of people show up on Monday unclear what they're gonna start doing on Monday morning. And so you kind of waste that time as you figure it out, sort of maybe check email a lot that came in and you finally get started later in the day or there's a lot of meetings on Monday, so you can't start real work till Tuesday, which is fine, except everyone's kind of petering out by Thursday, Friday, right? Mm -hmm. um, Friday is not a tremendously productive day in right. many workplaces. So that's fine, but if you're trying to work a reasonable number of hours and get a lot done in those hours, you can't afford to not use Monday, right? Especially if Friday goes downhill, you really got to seize Monday. And so to do that, I find one of the most effective things is to think about your weeks before you're in them and take a little bit of time on Friday afternoon, which again is kind of a low opportunity cost time. Mm -hmm. um, just create your, your, a list of your top priorities for the week, career, relationship, self. Look at the next 168 hours, put them in. Right. And you also in that section had be strategically seen, which I think applies particularly here because of uh, this conference audience. So yes, everyone's being strategically seen here, it's great. <laughs> Um, but, but what I mean by being strategically seen is, is, again, the thing with the happy hours. I mean, you don't have to go out every night. You don't have to go to every work dinner. You don't have to go to every conference. But don't say, I won't go to any, right? Because then you become the person that no one asks to go to it. Uh, and, and so by going occasionally, you keep yourself in the game. And, and you know, if you did three events a month, again, there's 30 days in a month, three events, that's three nights of 30, that's 10%. 90% you're not doing work stuff, but that three invested in work could go a long way. And what about the concept of meetings and buying more time in meetings? So I think generally we, you know, we tend to think of meetings as being 60 minutes long, and so, the, so then we use up that yeah. entire time span. It is funny. I don't understand why every meeting takes 30 or 60 minutes. So it's like these, 
<laughs> divinely decreed that all <laughs> meetings must take that. I mean, you could, you could show up with a 37.5 minute agenda and see what happens. I mean, people are going to think it's really well thought through <laughs> if it's right at that. Um, and, and that extra time, you know, can be used for other things. Or, but, you know, if, if shortening a meeting is one thing, mm -hmm. killing it is another idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd also encourage people to take time on Friday afternoon as you're thinking about your week, mm -hmm. to look at the next week in your calendar, see what you can kill that doesn't need to happen or doesn't need to take as long as it's booked for. Right, right. Um, so we should talk a bit about the home section. We talked a bit about work and meetings. Um, and you outlined 10 secrets for a happier home life, um, things like thinking through your evenings and your mornings. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, when we, I mean, if we work really hard, you come home and you kind of want to do nothing. But it's actually impossible to do nothing. And especially if you have young kids, like the, the nothing is really just going to be a lot of chasing after them and being tired and trying to figure out what's going on. Whereas if you psych yourself up for something you're going to do with the evening, um, you might wind up having a lot more fun. And it doesn't have to be elaborate, but just saying like, tonight we're going to all make Sundays together after dinner, or you know, we're going to go for a walk as a family, or here's a book I really want to read for story time at night. Mm -hmm. Just having a little bit of that same mindfulness that we bring to work and thinking of what's important for us to be doing, what priorities we have, increases the chances that our home life is spent well and in memorable ways. Right. Um, so who would you say this book is for? Because you, you interviewed highly successful women, you had you know, uh, a number of children at home. Um, does that mean it's only really meant for women who are in that position, or can men use it? I, I hope men will use it. I, I didn't make the book pink. It's, it's blue. Um, <laughs> so men, men can be seen reading it uh, if they would like. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, I chose to look at women who had big jobs and have families, because that's the group that everyone was like, I don't know how she does it. That all this literature about women and work and life seems to be centered on, it's impossible for women to have the big jobs because mm -hmm. they want to have full family lives and these two are completely incompatible. And yet here are all these people who are doing an amazing job combining the two. And they're not harried and they're not crazed. There are stressful moments to be sure, but there's a lot of really good stuff going on in their lives as well. And I think that deserves to be known. But, of course, because people have big jobs and something major going on in their personal lives, they had to come up with new ways of combining work and life and new mm -hmm. strategies for organizing their time. Um, and I think those strategies could be useful to anyone. I mean, whether you're a mom or not, whether you're a woman or not, whether you have a big job or not. If you are interested in um, combining work and a personal life in a way that works for you, then I think there's strategies in here that will work for it. So we have a room here really of, creative, of creatives. Um, and what would you say to the women in this room who um, think that having, such, having structure might affair with the creative process? Ah, uh, yes. Um, I get that a lot. I mean, I like to think of myself as reasonably creative. I write books. Uh, I like structure. But uh, not everyone does. And, and that's okay. Uh, I'm more of a planner. I'm the INTJ type, if, uh, if people are into that. Um, but there are ways to think ahead and to look forward, even if you don't believe in, in scheduling every minute. And I don't believe in scheduling every minute. I tend to think of, well, what are my top three priorities for the day? Mm -hmm. um, in, in the course of 24 hours, I'm pretty sure I can get to those top three. And three may not sound like much, but you know, three a day is like 15 a work week, and 15 a work week is 750 a year, and that's kind of a lot of stuff. So that's, that's, that's pretty decent. Yeah. Um, so if you just make limited priority lists and make sure that you get those things done, then the rest of the time, ideally, you'll create as much white space as possible. I think white space is great to have in any life, I mean, both for the creative process and both because it allows you to seize opportunities. I mean, if uh, somebody who reports to you comes to you and wants to talk about her career, Mm -hmm. Like telling her, well, you can come back at 4.12 because I have eight minutes then is a little bit disheartening, you know, yeah. <laughs> as you want to be able to seize those moments and, and having white space in your schedule allows for that. So for anyone here who wants to give this a try and wants to try mapping out their, their week um, and uh, see if it sort of helps them be more productive and more successful, how would they get started? Like what's the basic sort of idea to start with? Well, I really think that if you want to spend your time better, knowing how you spend it now is incredibly important. And 
the best way to do that is to keep track of it. Um, mm -hmm. There are a million time tracking apps. I think I hear from a new company every day that's launching one. Uh, they pretty much all do the same thing, which is that they keep track of your time. So find one that's free and works for you. Um, you can also use a, a spreadsheet. I had everyone in my book uh, do that. They log their time on, on a spreadsheet half hour by half hour. I kind of like that because then you can sort of see visually, you know, oh, I was going to bed later toward the end of the week or mm -hmm. whatever else happened uh, in, in the course of the week. But the format doesn't matter so much that you do it. And I think a lot of people just don't want to see how much time they're wasting. And that's fine. I mean, I waste time. You probably waste, maybe you don't waste time. But I think most of I us waste time. We, we waste time. <laughs> and and yeah. so it's not so much about that. It's about making sure that our lives look the way we want them to look. Because if they don't, we have the power to change that. I mean, we are, we're smart women. This is a rich country. And if there's something we're not happy with, we probably have the power to change that. Right. So I actually tried doing this myself. And what I found was um, in every sort of half hour time span, I was doing 10 different things. Like it was really hard to segment everything because I was doing a million of them at once. Yeah. So, and I can imagine that's true of a lot of people. It is. Um, as much as possible, I would encourage you to try to <laughs> monotask a wee bit more. Yeah, so actually it made me sort of stop and, you know, and try and sort of focus. Yeah, because that, when we feel pulled in lots of different directions at once. That's what makes us feel harried and stressed. Whereas if you actually give something your attention as long as you can, mm -hmm. it's amazing what your brain will come up with. I mean, both for the creative process and in terms of um, you know, anything else at work. I mean, even if you do have to be on email all the time, it might be better off to check it for 15 minutes and then be off it for 45, and then back on for 15 and off for 45. Or if you can't swing that, I mean, 20 and 40 or 30 and 30, but having 30 where you're not constantly pulled away. You can do a lot in 30 mm -hmm. focused minutes. And I think, you know, if you're used to having the phone constantly on, 30 focused minutes at work without it will seem like a long time, but you'll be amazed what happens. Yeah. I think that, you know, another um, way of looking at this, and I was discussing this with Kat, uh, the founder of the conference, was um, it's also about the way that we present our industries. So, for ex I mean, the, you know, with, in the sort of advertising or creative industries and other industries like banking, there's this perception that people work incredibly hard, um, and that can be off-putting to potential hires. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something you also can refer to. I do. I think, um, you know, we all like to talk about how crazy and busy we are. I mean, it's kind of human nature to compete in these things. Uh, the, the misery Olympics sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. but, but no one wins in the misery Olympics. And so it's really <laughs> just not worth getting into that competition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think especially as um, you look at younger women that you're trying to recruit and bring on board, if you make it sound so miserable, like why would anyone want to stay? Like why would they want to stay in it? Whereas if you talk about you know, the other interests you have and the full, wonderful life you have, mm -hmm. then, then that sounds much more appealing. Then people are willing to live through the stressful moments because they know that it isn't all a, a death march for the rest of time. Right, absolutely. So what are some of the takeaways that you would want to share with the women here? Um, well, certainly try keeping track of your time. I think another takeaway is to ask what you want to do more of with your time. Uh, I, I get a lot of sort of questions of like, well, I want to save time on X, Y, or Z, so I'm going to do errands in a way where I only have to make right-hand turns or, or something like that. And, and that's fine. You know, there's no point in spending extra time on things you don't want to do, but I think it's more productive to ask what you want to spend more time doing because then you can start filling your life with those things and magically other stuff takes less time. You know, when you're filling your time with the stuff that is enjoyable and meaningful for you and the people you care about, mm -hmm. you spend a lot less time hitting refresh on your inbox. Right. Anything else that you... Um, so I think that, uh, you know, what you've all been talking about today with recognizing the soft side of work, that it is about building the network and, and don't view things as either or. It's not, you know, stay late at work or go to the family. I mean, it can be both. It can be some nights you're late at work occasionally, other days you're going with the family. And then think in terms of 168 hours, not 24, because 168 hours is enough for almost anything you want to put into it. Mm -hmm. 24 hours probably isn't, but things don't have to happen at the same time every right. day to count. Right. So there are a few things that Kat wanted me to point out to the audience here that I'd love you to also comment on. So the first thing she said was rethink if do we think valuing those who burn the midnight oil over those who come in early since the brain is more effective at 8 a.m.? <laughs> 
It's true, and I know that creative industries get a reputation for the midnight oil being the time it, it, it works best. And, and if, you, if honestly, is that when you work best, then you may have to deal with that. Um, but on the other hand, lots of people are creative in the morning, and that doesn't make them actually less creative. Uh, and, and so if you are able to seize those morning hours, um, that is often a, a good way to fit many important things in your life, is to use the mornings. Uh, I'm not much of a morning person myself, but I keep trying. <laughs> Actually, there was an example in your book of someone who had noticed, that, or, or maybe it was something you referred to, that um, people who work late are, uh, are, are more seen, or sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of more visible yeah. than those who come in early. And so one of the women you interviewed actually experimented with coming in late but staying late, and that worked better than the other Yeah, one. well, she had young children, and so it turns out that, you know, hanging out with them from 6.30 to 10.30 in the morning is kind of a lot of time, right? And then so you've had four hours a day with your kid and then go into work and work 11 to 10 or whatever, but she already had her time. And so that was the way she could have both rather than thinking, well, I have to come in at eight o'clock in the morning and then right. everyone's staying till 10 o'clock anyway, because that's just what they did in their office. Um, so I thought that was a fun sort of way to get around that. Um, you know, in general, I think that probably most offices don't need to be there until 10 o'clock. That's its own separate issue that, mm -hmm. that should be dealt with on a more systematic level. But, uh, you know, you, you work with what you have to. Right. Um, another one was to consider the radical notion that many agencies exaggerate and falsely inflate work weeks to make some jobs appear off limits to those who care about having a life. Oh, I know. I, <laughs> so this is the thing. Um, the, the work week inflation is funny. Like, I love laughing about the idea that people who are claiming 80, 90, 100 hour work weeks are, are probably not working that. Or, one young man once told me he was working a 180 hour week. Um, <laughs> it's like, no, no, you're not. <laughs> Trust me, you're not. Um, but when I get in a sort of different frame of mind, I think it's a bit more insidious because by exaggerating work weeks, by claiming like everyone here works 100 hours a week, well, anyone who wants to you know, have a life is going to be like, well, that's not the place for me, or maybe I'll work there for a little bit, but I'm certainly going to get out before I have to rise up, up the ranks. And, you know, the competition toward the top of many fields is intense. And if you can mm -hmm. convince people who want a life that it's not for them, well, hey, you just knocked out a big chunk of the competition. Right. And, and so I think that that's a bit of something behind it as well. Yeah, you had an example of someone who joined a hedge fund. Yeah, yeah. One, of the, one of the women I interviewed uh, worked at, at a hedge fund and uh, she kept track of her time for me. She worked about a 48 hour week. She did no work on the weekends. I was like, is that typical? She said, actually it really is. Uh, she went to like a preschool event in the morning. It, you know, it was all fine and I'm sure it's a lot of money. Uh, but what she said is in, in business school, she'd known some guys who were into the hedge fund thing and they were very macho and like, ooh, you know, this is, mm -hmm. this is the crazy world, like people just can't hack it here. <laughs> and then she actually decided to interview and get, she got a job and she realized that it wasn't like that at all. I mean, there's some firms that maybe are and there's some pockets of firms, but you can move around it. And given that it had that industry, that, that reputation as an industry, she said it scares people off from even interviewing. Like I try to tell people that my life is so good yeah. and they're like, but it's in finance. It must not be. Yeah. <laughs> um, the final one was rethink valuing presenteeism, those physically in the office versus those working elsewhere. So, you know, there's a lot of this debate back and forth about is it better to work in the office, is more innovative, or is it better to work elsewhere where you might be more productive? And I say yes. Yes to both, right? <laughs> uh, these, these things do not have to be either or. I mean, yes, it's great to interact with colleagues face to face. A lot of stuff happens face to face that doesn't happen when you're apart. But on the other hand, five days a week is probably overkill. And if you think about it, a lot of times when people are sitting in their offices, they're not interacting anyway. Mm -hmm. But they might be getting interrupted all the time in a way that doesn't work for them and work for cranking things out. And so if you can come up with a system where you can get the best of both worlds, and I've seen this some places of people doing like core hours that everyone agrees to be in the office. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's you know, 10 to 3 or 10 to 4 a couple days a week, you're all there. And then if people want to work early and leave at 4, that's fine. If people want to come in at 10 and work till 8 or whatever, that's fine. And if they want to work from home on other days, that's also totally cool. And that way people can arrange their schedules in a way that works for them. So you get the best of the serendipitous encounter, encounters and the mm -hmm. innovation that happens from that. And you also get the best of, you know, buckling down and getting it done. Right. So um, were there any, any women in the book who changed their lives radically as a result of having done the exercise? There were a couple who did. Um, 
you know, many had been thinking about things for mm -hmm. a while, and, and I think the keeping track of their time may have pushed things a, a little bit. Um, there was certainly uh, one woman who had, I mean, sort of an admirable schedule from the perspective of her employer and her family. Um, she had managed to work what I call a split shift, like she was leaving work at a very reasonable hour every night, going home, and then working more after the kids go to bed. Mm -hmm. um, so basically was there when the bus got home, doing like two or three hours of work at night. And, and that's fine if it works for you, but it was like, she was spending every single waking moment either on her employer or her kids. Right. And she was spending a lot of time on both. I was like, when she saw that on her log, she's like, hmm, I used to feel guilt. I don't feel guilt anymore. <laughs> she's like, maybe I could go to the gym. It would yeah. be okay to go to the gym. Right. Like, they don't all need all of me. I can have a little bit of time for myself in this as well. And I thought that that was, was very profound. Yeah. And, and I would encourage people who are worried about the idea of keeping a time log to think of it in terms of that. Because often you see that you are giving a lot to other people, but you may not be doing as much that you would find enjoyable. And you deserve to be on there too. Right. I think that's a great way to end this. Thank you very much, Laura. That was fantastic. Thank you. I'll be out, out there with my books if people... Uh... Oh, sorry. <laughs>